Hello, and welcome to this webinar titled Viral Safety by Design for Cell and Gene Therapy Products, hosted by Biopharma Asia magazine and presented by Mark Plavzik, Chief Technology Officer at Lysagene, and Archie Lovett, Life Sciences Biosafety Scientific Director at SGS. My name is Stephen Edwards, and I'll be your moderator. Now, please allow me to introduce our first presenter. Mark is Chief Technology Officer at Lysagene, a late-stage clinical development gene therapy company with headquarters in Paris, France. Prior to joining Lysagene, Mark was, Mark was SVP of Process Development and Manufacturing at Talk Therapeutics, Inc., an immunology company located in Cambridge, MA. Prior to joining Talk, Mark served as a head of product biosafety at Genzyme Sanofi, responsible for process improvements and biosafety of biological products and associated manufacturing processes. Previously, Mark was in charge of gene therapy development at Genzyme, overseeing the upstream, downstream, formulation, and analytical developments of viral vectors used in gene therapy applications. Prior to Genzyme, Mark held senior positions with AstraZeneca, Q1 Biotech, and Life Technologies, Inc. Mark's technical experience spans across a wide spectrum of drug development and manufacturing activities, including more materials, R&D, QC testing, GLP non-clinical studies, process development, GMP manufacturing, GMP contact testing, and GMP contract manufacturing. Mark's education includes Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree, MSc, and PhD degree in virology and immunology. I will now be handing over to our first presenter. Welcome, Dr. Flavsik. Thank you, Stefan. The purpose of this talk is to address a holistic biosafety approach for cell and gene therapy products and to discuss elements of product biosafety by design. Biosafety is defined as a safety from biological and antisource agents. Allow me to define adventitious agents. Adventitious agents definitions are you know, typically defined as exogenous uh, agents to the manufacturing process and final medicinal products. These agents are typically regarded as undesired product impurity, and they include bacteria, yeast, chlamydia, rickettsia, mycoplasma, viruses, prions, and protozoa. Most of my talk today is going to be centered around viruses. In addition to adventitious agents, there are certain endogenous uh, agents endogenous to the process and product that may also endanger product safety profile. These include endogenous retroviruses associated with your cells, replication component retrovirus, replication component adenovirus, and replication component adeno-associated virus. Let me define the potential source of viruses. Adventitious agents and adventitious viruses could potentially come from a number of different sources. First, from donors and their tissues. Raw materials of animal and human origin. Cell culture media and reagents could also serve as potential source of adventitious agents. Starting materials such as cells, cell banks, plasmids, viral banks. Manufacturing operators, meaning human factors associated with production, especially those who are acutely infected or chronic carriers of uh, uh, infectious agents. Manufacturing equipment, manufacturing facilities and utilities, and certainly pests uh, could serve as potential water portal of entry of agents into manufacturing product screen. Finally, allow me also to uh, bring to your attention a few important uh, characteristics of cell and gene manufacturing processes. Uh, they are unique manufacturing uh, processes, unique in a way that in cell therapies, the cells are the products, and the product, meaning cells, uh, there is no downstream purification, and, which is simply not practical. In gene therapy, uh, either cells in case of uh, uh, ex vivo or viral vectors in case of in vivo are the product. In a classical biological sense, viral clearance in downstream processing uh, is possible uh, in specific cases like monoclonal antibodies, recombinant proteins, where pH treatment, lipid solvents, heat treatment, and uh, other uh, you know, modalities can be used to actually clear the viruses from these classical biological products. However, these technologies are typically impractical or not possible to use in case of cell and gene therapy products. 
even if they are to be used, their applications are very limited. So how is the risk of viral, viral entry going to be mitigated? There are two main approaches to viral risk mitigation for cell engine therapies and for biologics in general. First, the so-called classical safety triangle or safety tripod approach. And the second one is the holistic uh, broader approach based on quality and safety by design. In terms of biosafety triangle, Three main elements of the biosafety triangle include selection, detection, and clearance. Obviously, in cell engine therapy products, as mentioned earlier, clearance is problematic because you know it has limited utility, especially in cell therapies. In terms of selection, that basically means selection of raw materials, or in some cases, selection of donors. However, in this particular case, donor is usually a patient, so selection of donors is impractical. The patient is a given. Selection of critical raw materials in production is practical, and uh, that is the main focus of the selection. And final detection, part of the triangle is also an important element which utilizes a number of detection technologies to actually look for adventitious agents. So it is clear from this triangle that in the case of cell engine therapy applications, most emphasis should be placed on selection and, and viral detection. In terms of safety by design approach, which is a more holistic uh, 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 approach, an effective viral risk mitigation should be built into the whole manufacturing supply chain, and it typically begins in an early product development phase. And by holistic uh, approach and whole manufacturing supply chain, I mean starting from the raw material and starting material, uh, product and media preparation, USP, downstream processing, fill finish, and also putting emphasis on suppliers as well as CMOs and CROs where applicable. So now I would like to transition to actually uh, discussing the product uh, quality and safety by design, and the rest of the talk is going to be centered around that. Adoption of quality by design and safety by design principles during the early product development is, it is very important, it's basically essential. And biosafety in this case needs to be built into the product uh, intentionally. Safety by design, which is going to be part of the quality by design, includes a series of so-called interconnected elements spanning the manufacturing process. And I emphasize the word interconnected because all of these need to be actually talking to one another as opposed to living in their own entity, you know, separately. And these elements include quality system enhancements, raw material control, manufacturing process development, and detection technologies. Ultimate goal of all these interconnected elements is to A, prevent virus from entering to the production stream, B, if it enters, to detect it as soon as early as possible, and once detected, it needs to be responded to by way of containing it and eliminating it as soon as possible. Allow me now to discuss each of these four elements separately. In terms of quality system enhancement, ultimate goal is to incorporate product safety into the quality systems. In other words, product safety and quality system do not need to exist as two separate entities. They need to be embedded into one another. And in many cases, quality system does include a safety element, but there are also cases where quality system is not quite clear on viral safety uh, situation. So in this particular case, I'm trying to say that the following elements need to be built in the quality system. A written comprehensive risk mitigation program for adventitious agents should ideally exist and uh, uh, serve as a ground for future uh, implementation. Beyond that, a written contamination response plan should be in place so that one knows how to respond in case a contamination is detected. And on a specific SOP level, Certain SOPs need to be modified, or additionally, uh, SOPs can be written to actually incorporate specific adventitious agent safety uh, as appropriate and where appropriate. Training module for employees need also should be in place, uh, so to address the impact of uh, adventitious agents on product and also on patient safety. And finally, quality risk management and risk assessment uh, is uh, you know, an important element of quality systems, whereby risk assessment should be basically systematic, thorough, process product-based, and should be ongoing with periodic risk evaluation and re-evaluation. 
quality system, uh, if designed properly, you know, needs to actually, uh, you know, enable system-driven approach to viral mitigation, and it spans uh, across all supply chain from raw materials. When it comes down to raw materials and starting material, obviously selection is a very important element, and use of chemically defined media uh, or other agents is, you know, is important element to consider early stage. If chemically defined media is not available, and if human or animal origin components need to be used, then ad adoption of so-called three R's is essential, which basically means replace it, reduce it, or refine it. And there are examples how that can be done using carbonatrypsin, serum replacement, or serum reduction as well. The risk evaluation for most critical materials you know, is also a, a very important element of managing uh, raw materials. Safety by design, implementation, and the supplier end supply of critical raw materials is also an important element to build the safety by design at the supplier end and to ensure a good uh, practice at that level. Meaningful testing and even more importantly, mean, uh, meaningful material specifications for the adventitious agents are uh, essential ones because they drive the whole testing process and uh, uh, management of the safety at that level. Beyond testing, treatment of raw materials for viral clearance uh, is in other elements to consider, and here UVC, gamma radiation, and other other technologies can be can be implemented. Realizing that these are always helpful as single tools, but they do not they are not equally effective against all viruses. And also, although they provide the risk reduction, they do not necessarily eliminate the risk risk altogether. Starting materials, just a, a short one to define what I mean by starting materials. In cell and gene therapies, these may include patient cells, cell banks, plasmids, and viral seeds. Uh, and most of the elements I mentioned for raw materials would apply in starting materials as well. So staying on the raw materials, allow me to elaborate on the uh, R principles. In many cases, serum is used in production. And in many cases, high concentration of serum is used in production, 10% or so. Uh, this slide illustrates that reduction of serum can be actually attempted and uh, usually be successful, going from 10% down to 5 and even further more down to 2%. So in this particular case, serum was reduced from 10% to 2% without impacting cell performance. Use of animal serum also is a very important safety element uh, overall and understanding the safety of the serum is an uh, important element, oftentimes uh, very uh, highly emphasized by regulatory agencies as well. Country of origin is an important part to consider the serum. Animal health, infectious disease status in the source country is also important. Blood collection processes, serum pooling and manufacturing processes play an important role as well. And finally, testing of the serum in accordance with the current regulatory Guidance principles is also an uh, essential element of the whole serum risk, risk management. Uh, beyond that, new and emerging pathogens are also important, and uh, you know they should never be forgotten. Agencies are also very uh, important, big on, on, on putting emphasis on managing emerging and new pathogens. And finally, inactivation treatment for serum. Uh, gamma radiation is recommended by International Serum Industry Association as a preferred modality for serum treatment. And in the next slide, I'm going to just kind of illustrate briefly how gamma radiation works. In many cases, it is effective for a wide range of viruses. There are few viral families that are typically regarded as more radio resistant, and these include circoviruses, parvoviruses, and polyomaviruses. So in most cases, it will reduce virus to, to appropriate level, and in some cases, it may be actually less effective, although some virus still can be actually deactivated by gamma radiation. Now moving to the process development and manufacturing uh, manufacturing process element. In this particular case, it basically means incorporation of safety by design in early, late, and commercial phases of product life cycle. Development of so-called animal origin free cell banks is a, uh, you know, should be considered in an early stage of process and product development. Uh, in which particular case, uh, thorough testing and characterization of the banks, even in the, uh, the animal origin and uh, human origin free banks, is important as well. But beyond cell bank development uh, and development of animal origin free manufacturing processes should also be attempted. And if it's not possible, adoption of the principles discussed earlier plays an important role as well. 
Additionally, use of so-called upstream viral barrier technologies uh, plays a big role, especially in the application of cell and gene therapies, in some cases in viral therapies as well. In, here, I specifically mean on UVC, treatment by uh, heat and nanofiltration. Each of these here plays, and each of these uh, here values and uh, in the uh, benefits and uh, in the disadvantages as well. Use of disposable single-use technologies uh, plays an important role in uh, in the modern manufacturing process in cell and gene therapies, uh, and as well managing open processing steps uh, should be uh, uh, also considered. In, it's, as a fact, uh, open processing steps should be should also be avoided. In case it cannot be avoided, they need to be handled in an appropriate manner because they may present a potential point of vulnerability. Sampling plans and process monitoring for signs of adventitious agent contamination also uh, should be uh, considered uh, in early stage development and implemented in late stage development and commercial phase as well. Effective validated in bio clearance steps in downstream processing where they are feasible. And as mentioned earlier, in cell therapies, typically this is not going to be possible. In gene therapy, there are places where some of these integration technologies may play a role. Uh, chemical treatment, for example, or even larger pore size nanofilters, uh, 35, 50, 70 nanometer pore size may actually be considered as well. Facility management and equipment management and cleaning and sanitization also are uh, essential, especially in cases where uh, multi-purpose, multi-use equipment is uh, in place. Manufacturing personnel awareness and training, as mentioned earlier, plays an important role in the overall viral biosafety system. And facility and utility design and ongoing facility employment program are also an uh, important part of the holistic approach towards viral risk management. I mentioned earlier barrier technology, uh, and uh, here I'm going to illustrate an example of use an, use an example of uh, nano nanotechnology, nanofilters of 10 nanometer pore size. When we speak of viral barriers and viral removal, it is 10 nanometer pore filter size that really are regarded as the essential element uh, for viral removal. In this, this particular case, uh, cell culture medium supplemented with serum uh, has been uh, treated by nanofiltration. This slide illustrates, especially two bottom uh, figures, that nanofiltered serum uh, with 20 nanometer pore size filters performed satisfactorily in terms of uh, cell uh, attachment and also doubling times. So performance is typically not affected in any appreciable manner. Beyond cell performance, viral vector production also is quite satisfactory. On the left side uh, is the control uh, before treatment, and on the right side, the tighter and specific cell productivity uh, you know, appears quite uh, okay, unaffected within the analytical method variability. So in this particular case, nanofilter uh, nanofiltration technology uh, works uh, quite uh, well. And I want to just emphasize a few points to consider when implementing nanofiltration as a potential viral barrier. First of all, nanofiltration uh, is generally regarded as a very effective step, and there are a number of studies performed uh, to demonstrate that more than uh, four logs of parvovirus can be removed using these filters. Visibility for raw material treatment is also uh, uh, you know, uh, possible, it's uh, as seen in this particular study, and it can be used for medium and serum as well. It is actually a good choice for cell and gene therapy applications uh, as a barrier technology because there isn't much room to uh, implement anything into the downstream or final stages of production. And also, it is a great choice for cell banking applications when cell banks are manufactured, where media and e agents used in the cell banking process can be actually treated to ensure highest level of safety for cell banks. Importantly, also, it, it is validatable. And uh, it is uh, important to stress, stress that it is perhaps not always feasible to use for viral vector treatment in downstream purification processes because typically virus is a product and the smallest virus being AAV as a product cannot be nanofiltered because we will be left without product. But higher pore filter size such as 35, 40, 50, 75 could be considered for some larger virus uh, reduction and can be evaluated.
moving control detection te technologies and detection element of uh, the holistic viral risk uh, and uh, mitigation. In this particular case, detection would span across raw materials, cell banks, intermediates, and final products. There are three main uh, points to make. First one, the testing design should be compliant and suitable for the intended process. Second one is the adoption of new technology, technology should be considered as it becomes proven. And finally, addressing new and emerging uh, viral agents. As far as the uh, testing being compliant and suitable, there are a number of guidance elements uh, today uh, that drive what kind of testing can be done and at what point and which methods can be used. However, each of these have certain limitations, and it is very important to actually understand the limitations of the existing uh, detection technologies and find a way to actually address those gaps. That is where the uh, adoption of new technologies play, plays an important role, and there are a few options available. Uh, certainly, I would like to stress uh, one that is called next generation sequencing or deep sequencing or massively parallel sequencing, which appears to be over the course of the last several years gaining momentum and uh, several companies have actually implemented this technology at certain points in the manufacturing process. In terms of addressing new and emerging agents, this is typically done by a risk assessment to understand what agents could actually be uh, presenting specific threat and then developing a way to detecting uh, and managing these particular agents. And they can be also uh, implemented in human and animal serum as well. In terms of detection tools, for adventitious agents, there are a number available so far. They are uh, general in nature or specific uh, in nature. For example, in vitro detection, which use cell-based applications for 14 or 28 days is probably one of the working course in viral detection environment today. However, in vivo animal studies uh, also are an uh, important part uh, and they are still regarded as an, as an inevitable element of the holistic um, cell bank characterization and some other applications. Antibody production using animals also play, plays a role at this point in time, as well as retrovirus detection battery of assays, where retroviruses also uh, play an important biosafety element. Electron microscopy is another tool uh, used to uh, detect and in some cases even identify viruses at least to a family or genus level. And uh, furthermore, specific viral detection using nucleic acid amplification tools targeting specific known agents uh, also is uh, part of the whole pop, um, battery of uh, viral detection technologies. On top of that, serological methods uh, are also utilized to detect or in some cases identify virus. And finally, there are well-described techniques for replication competent agents such as RCR, RCA, and RCAAV. On top of these, uh, well established uh, and uh, you know, available for many years so far, uh, as mentioned earlier, it is important to consider limitations of these and implement specific PCRs for new and emerging agents based on the risk, or perhaps develop uh, you know, wider scrap and detection techniques such as MPS or NGS uh, and uh, adopt them uh, in places where it is warranted. This uh, illustrates uh, you know, the in vitro cell-based assay, which I mentioned earlier is a, uh, probably one of the most important single assays today, uh, using the cells, uh, indicator cells. Uh, example of these cells is given here, Vero MFC and production cell line, but it can be modified. And key advantage of this one is actually it can detect live virus, but it also has a number of limitations that needs to be considered. Uh, no discussion on uh, Viral risk mitigation and cell and gene therapies can be complete without considering emerging biosafety issues and emerging viruses as well. And a big emphasis is given on animal and human agents. Uh, so uh, examples of some human bovine agents is listed here as well as human ones. Uh, just to uh, mention a few examples of human uh, emerging agents being Zika, MERS, Seneca virus, and a few others. Uh, so staying on top of these agents and understanding impact on production and final product is a certainly important part. This slide summarizes pretty much the main key points of my discussion so far and comparing uh, you know, how biosafety triangle fits into the overall picture of safety by design. 
uh, indicated in blue he, are the elements of ISFP triangle, and you can see that although it plays a big role, certainly uh, it is not alone sufficient enough to address the, uh, the whole uh, problem of uh, viral safety. So holistic approach is definitely more and uh, more thorough, and more encompassing, and recommended for biological and cell gene therapy processes and products. To conclude, viral contaminations for manufacturing processes are indeed a rare occurrences, but when they happen, they have a potential to bring serious consequences, and therefore they require constant vigilance. Viral safety is an important critical quality attribute of any medicinal drug product. And testing alone, although very important, is very helpful, but it does not provide complete solution to viral safety. Similarly, biosafety triangle, meaning selection, testing, and clearance, although very useful alone, it is not sufficient enough in cell engine therapy applications. And while downstream viral clearance may not always be feasible, upstream viral clearance, you know, upstream viral barriers can, offer, can oftentimes actually provide quite a valuable solution. In cell engine therapy manufacture, Emphasis is therefore placed on prevention and virus detection. And finally, safety and quality should be built into the product by design intentionally from early development in order to avoid high, to, uh, to afford highest level of product safety and patient protection at the end of the day. With this, I would like to conclude and I would like to turn back to Stefan. Thank you, Dr. Plasnik. Once again, I would like to remind our viewers that there'll be a live Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Please feel free to send in your questions at any time during the webinar via the questions tab located directly below your webinar screen, and we'll go through these at the end of the presentation. Now please allow me to introduce our second presenter. Archie Lovett is a biopharmaceutical vaccine gene and cell therapy biosafety testing expert. He graduated from the University of Glasgow with a BSc honors in microbiology in 1990. He played his studies at the Medical Science Institute, University of Leicester, researching the genetic analysis of microbial virulence factors and graduated with a PhD in molecular microbiology. In 1994, Dr. Lovett was awarded a postdoctoral fellowship at the Cancer Research UK Beeston Institute to genetically dissect transcriptional factors and investigate their role in central nervous system cellular differentiation. Between 1996 and 2007, he was scientific director of Q1 Biotech Bioreliance in Vitrogen uh, under Life Technologies, based in Glasgow, UK. He pioneered the development and implementation of quantitative PCR and PERT services for the testing of cell substrates and viral vectors slash vaccines. During his 11-year tenure, Dr. Lovett built and directed several assay development validation and testing teams and implemented the Q1 Biotech and BioReliance R&D pipeline into routine operations at Glasgow. Until 2005, he focused on molecular biology and virality divisions and also in the routine lot released testing operations under GLP and CGMP compliance. Thereafter, he played role in technical direction R&D regulatory services, business development, and in strategic direction. In early 2007, Dr. Lovett co-founded the world-class high-growth CRO Vitrology, acquired by SCS in 2012, and served on the board as scientific operations director, a position he holds to the present day. In 2015 and 2016, he was in the top 100 most influential people in human medicine development and manufacture. He serves on USP scientific expert volunteer groups. I will now be handing over to our second presenter. Welcome, Dr. Lovett. Thanks, Stephen. And thanks, Mark, also for the invite and opportunity to present, co-present with you with uh, Biofarm. Um, so uh, really, my first slide here is really just a diagram just to recap on Mark, what Mark was saying. You know, the viral contamination risk of a cell and gene therapy, manufacturing process, how different viruses can come in from the media, the supplements, the pest control here you can see MVM has been a you know a standard contaminant in the industry for many years. Also the donor, the endogenous viruses that could be within the donor of a cell therapy or the cell substrate used to manufacture a viral 
sector, and also GMP failure, potentially, you know, operator um, breakdown or facility breakdown, HVAC breakdown, where potentially uh, viruses from the actual GMP process itself can get into the cells. Um, so the next slide really um, will focus on the different checkpoints, and it's really just an overview. And we'll go into more detail on the different checkpoints within the manufacturing process, where we can actually find the virus early on and uh, eliminate it from the process. So essentially, the first sort of process of the start materials, the you know the, the medias, the supplements would all be tested. There would be viral risk assessment done. The cell substrate would do, go full characterisation using a whole battery of different methods that. Mark had um, summarised in the previous slides, and also the, the viral vector itself, the plasmids that may be used to make the viral vector, or the, the viral seed made to used to make the, the the actual virus itself that would be used as the gene therapy delivery system, and then during the production service itself, the actual bulk release product would be tested. It could be a plasmid, it could be a viral vector. It could be in the cells themselves that have been manufactured. It would be then put into the patient. And then there's also these new therapies, CAR T, which we are extracting patients from the cells and we are in, inserting that retroviral vector in there to then transduce these cells and put them back into the patients. And on this right hand side, you'll see that this type of product may require really fast throughput rapid screen analysis such as the next generation sequencing, deep sequencing and PCR pro, eh, eh, methods for viruses because the, 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 the window to get the cells into the patient is very short and it doesn't stand up to the conventional methods which are of long duration. Um, next slide, really just to summarise here, cell bank and virus seed generally when you follow the guidelines, ICH guidelines, the Q5 guidelines, FDA guidelines for cell bank characterization, and the USP, WHO, and the, the Pharmacopeia, uh, similar guidelines, you essentially split the cell bank or the seed or the vector into identity testing, where I'll talk about the different methods where we use, uh, that we use for identity testing, and genetic stability, where we want to show uh, the vector is genetically stable throughout the manufacturing process so that the end product that goes into the patient is actually the same as what the, the expected sequence of the vector should be. And then purity, the checkpoints, bacteria, fungi, classic sterility, mycoplasma, the different methods that can be used for this, and also the, the different methods that are needed for the viruses, broad specificity, the in vitro that Mark touched on, the in vivos, and also non-targeted NGS, and we'll discuss a bit about non-targeted NGS later on. Retroviruses, generally they need a different approach where you electron microscopy, you've got infectivity, PCR, and also reverse transcriptase, enzyme activity uh, tests, uh, and also species-specific, which can, we can use targeted NGS for viruses that may be identified of concern or are of risk in the process. PCR, 9 CFR, which is a legal responsibility, where it's a classical um, in vitro cell based system with immunofluorescent endpoints looking for bovine porcine assays. If there's been bovine or porcine material in the history of the cells or the, or the, or the, the vector production system, and um, also any rodent or pest viruses <coughs> that may be of concern. So, this, this slide here really just shows. You know, it's like a classical uh, viral vector manufacturing system. It's also it's very similar to how you would manufacture a viral vaccine. Um, so essentially, for example, if you had an adenovirus um, vector, which uh, you may have a working seed here, where you would characterise the master seed, the working seed, and you would also uh, characterise the cell bank, which you're going to grow that on, and then also on the unprocessed bulk. And the control cells here on the right hand side are generally uninfected cells which are um, not infected by the vector, but they 
they are tested for adventitious agents, and the reason why they, these are, are tested is really to ensure that we can detect any underlying um, adventitious agents that may be suppressed by the growth of the actual vector itself. So that's why we have two separate cultures here. Um, so the next slide, yep. So next slide, really just to focus on for the cell bank, the um, the viral vector or the plasmids identity and stability. Uh, generally, sequencing is a really good technology here. You've got the classical Sanger. Uh, it's a validated system, fully GMP. It's generally used to release testing on final product vectors, such as adeno-associated vectors, which are small um, vectors which can be rapidly sequenced using this technology. It's robust. It's been around for 30 years. It's fully accepted by the, the regulatory authorities um, for release testing. Uh, and it, it gives good coverage on each strand if you design the appropriate um, primers and, uh, for that system. There's also the new technologies that Mark had um, mentioned. Um, these technologies, they're emerging, they're becoming GMP, they're becoming more GMP, um, and there's different platforms available. They're very good for when you've got large vectors such as vaccinia or adenovirus. Um, where they can sequence a lot of the, the genomic DNA very quickly. Um, they're also used now more in the pathogen detection, which we'll go on to uh, in the next slides. And they can also provide um, some information if there's variants of different populations of the vector um, in the actual preparation. Uh, but it does come with bioinformatics um, challenges and it requires a specialist skill base. Also for the cell substrates, generally fingerprinting is, is a requirement, pharmacopoeia, USP, uh, FDA guidelines, uh, and these techniques are really focused to, to the individual so they can really discriminate if there's a cross-contamination between different cell substrates and also you can compare them to reference um, cells from ATCC, etc., um, and you can show by a, a, a method where you're using amplification with different primers uh, to show a pattern of the cell substrate using six different primers. And there's other newer techniques on the market called um, STR or shock tandem repeat, um, which can use the, the sequencing technology also. And this, this cell substrate will eventually evolve uh, with NGS also in the future as NGS evolves. Purity, uh, generally there's standard pharmacopoeia methods that are between 15 days for the sterility. Mycoplasma is a 28-day assay. Uh, mycobacteria is a 56-day assay. These generally use broth and agar to detect the, um, the microbial agents. But with the cell and gene therapies, we need much more rapid um, systems. So mycoplasma, for example, there's um, numerous um, kits on the market which can use, that are validated to be um, equivalent in terms of sensitivity and de de detection for mycoplasma. So you can use PCR, you can get a short turnaround time there in seven days or quicker versus the 28-day assay. Sterility, there's other methods that are, in, that are available for that too, using colorimetric changes and CO2. Uh, mycobacteria. There's real-time PCR uh, that has been approved on the market for certain viral vaccines um, that have a short manufacturing space, and this um, can be utilised perhaps also in the gene and cell therapy should mycobacteria be um, identified as a risk. <coughs> so just a, another diagram here, similar to Mark's, about the in, vit the in vitro assay, classical you know, required by the guidelines, 28 day or 14 day assay on the on the bulk harvest, 28 day on the cells, and um, really just to say here that it's um, it can be hooked up at the end with immunofluorescence enzyme activity assays to look for retroviruses called PERT or product enhanced reverse transcriptase or reverse transcriptase assays, electron microscopy and also PCR, nucleic acid detection, and even potentially NGS. So we could have a much more um, sensitive and um, broader 
detection system than we currently have with the classical redoubts of cytopathic effect, effect and heme absorption megalonation. <clears throat> so in vivo assays, still standard in the industry, still standard for the cell bank characterization and the viral vector characterization. Previously, uh, up until recently, the the, um, the the pharmacopoeias from Europe and USP and FDA were they, they weren't fully harmonised in terms of the methodology uh, for this. But now there is a recent update in the fact the European pharmacopoeia that al allows a harmonisation approach of the FDA uh, in vivo compendial method and the the European compendial method, and it also can meet the ICHQ5A. So you can design a system now that can be fully compliant across the global um, regulatory authorities. And, uh, and in some cases, when you may have a viral vector which could cause cytopathic effects, you really need to maybe be looking at, at generating a neutralizing antisera early on in the development of the product, because we'll have to use that neutralizing antisera in these classical um, models for virus detection. So we'll need to neutralize your vaccine or viral vector or seed in order to um, take that out and show that it, it doesn't um, cause a problem in the test and allow any other adventitious agent to come through the test. TEM, good old technology, really um, rapid. It's a broad specificity. It can really be used as the first port of call if there's a, a potential suspected contamination event where we can look alongside NGS and, and see whether the, these, um, these particles, which can then give us a lot of evidence more on the NGS signal if it comes up, for example, it was used for cache valley detection in CHO cells, and it's been used for other, other contamination events to identify the virus that's causing the contamination, and also the um, to, to find where the root cause of that potential contamination is due. So really a supplementary assay with NGS, PCR, and in vitro. Um, and it's required to be done on all cell substrates uh, by the regulators. And also it can be used on the, the viral seed for morphology and then characteristics of the particles. Uh, we touched on PER assay. So PER is a reverse transcriptase that uses a PCR-based platform, so it's really highly sensitive. It can detect like 10 to 100 particles of retroviral uh, particles, and it detects the reverse transcriptase inside the particle that converts the RNA genome into cDNA. And it's a full requirement for all cell substrates and for viral seeds for the pharmacopoeias and um, the guidelines. Um, it, it also, it, yeah, it could be susceptible um, to contamination by DNA polymerases from the cells, so these can act like reverse transcriptase. However, there is ways to knock out this DNA polymerase from the cells. We're using an activated cathimus in the, in the system, and you can see here in this publication uh, that we did with King's College London on stem cells, you can see this without ACT DNA. It was positive and with it was negative. So there is an ability to knock out the DNA polymerase endogenous uh, activity of the cell substrate and only detect retroviral. And if there's a positive result on this, it's um, the pharmacopoeia request that you must do an infectivity uh, test, uh, which is essentially uh, putting the sample on to detector cells that are highly sensitive to retroviral detection, such as HEC293, um, and growing this over several passages. And then you put, perform the PERT assay or RTAs assay at the end on the supernatants after passage 8. So this is just really an example here where you would um, spike the sample with 10 units of um, urine leukemia virus. and you would see at the end after passage a really low CT value, which is indicative of a positive. The test item 40 would be indicative of, of negative and the positive control. So thereby, if you do get a signal in the pair assay, you can conclude by an infectivity assay um, that it is negative.
and it's probably a false positive called, caused by the DNA polymerase. Um, so going on to, to uh, PCR, NGS, nucleic acid detection, the use of molecular methods. For years now, the sort of standard has been the qPCR assays. There's over 300 fully validated assays on the market now um, to cover all of the viruses of concern. And this is a rapidly growing list as, we, as new agents of concern are identified. And then NGS is helping identify those new agents and, and grow that list. Uh, and also we have um, NGS, the new technology, non-targeted, where essentially it's a shotgun of the nucleic acid from the sample and the, the manufacturing process. Uh, and we'd like eight adapters on there, and then we would sequence all of that DNA or nucleic RNA uh, that's been converted to cDNA in there. Uh, we would be then compare that to databases and we would then be looking for uh, uh, agents based on the GenBank database. There's also a way in where we can use targeted approach where we are targeting specific viruses um, that have been identified as a risk in the process um, and that can be done really quickly. Um, and any of these um, hits that you get from this NGS, so you can screen for thousands of viruses, and you can use the targeted approach or the untargeted approach is pretty much um, unknown viruses and known viruses. You would really need to go back in and try and identify whether there's particles or nucleic acid and whether it's infectious or not. And this, so this is where the the other conventional methods like TEM infectivity PCR would come in in order to help you confirm uh, that that result by NGS. <clears throat> this is really from the same publication of, this, of the stem cell characterization where we're using PCR here. You can see the classical um, human viruses that are of concern in a stem cell bank and also the bacteria such as uh, syphilis and chlamydia in this area that were in this um, cell bank. And that was shown to be clean and all the spike positives here. So it's just really an example of the sort of data set that you can get from the, the um, testing of a stem cell or a human cell substrate. This slide really is um, just an overview of viral detection systems. Uh, it's comparing in vitro assay with PCR, non-targeted NGS and targeted NGS. And it's really just to highlight here the in vitro assay is still a pivotal, pivotal test in the testing of all products uh, and cells, and also the, it's, um, it, it's pretty much unlimited what it can detect because you know a virus can cause CPE. Some may not grow in cell culture, some do, so it's very difficult to quantify you know the number of viruses that could be detected in a test run. Uh, PCR, very specific, only for what you're looking for. Um, you can generally get tens in a test run. So um, you can see how with NGS here, um, when you're using targeted NGS, you can really uh, ramp up to hundreds and you could potentially also have the equivalent of the in vitro assay, but much faster with the non-targeted NGS. But again, here on the bottom, we're trying to show that you would need confirmatory testing should you get a positive in any one of these systems. So they all work in tandem with each other. And also the sensitivity of them is, uh, can be, is now similar. Um, really just these next slides are really just the, vi the type of viruses that are, you know, have been identified today on the market that are of concern um, in the system. So the human viruses, you know, latent viruses, measles, ones from operators, etc. The porcine viruses that could have been come from the porcine trypsin if it's been used in the, the manufacturing process or in the cell substrate previously. Um, and then bovine viruses. The serum has been there um, and also avian for any um, Avian products where there may, if, you, if for example, a vaccinia has been um, cultured on an avian system or eggs or avian cells, these are the sort of identified risks 
here that, that need to be looked for by QPCR and also NGS. So, um, next one really just simian viruses and the murines and the bacterials. Um, this really just to end this, I'm going to show some test schedules really. So, this is just an example of a cell substrate. Um, test schedule where we're looking at the master, the working end of production and the control cells and where we would do the testing for each one of these um, particular adventitious agent testing and the identity. This is a harmonised type of example where we're trying to meet FDA vaccine, um, for example, an oncolytic um, vector or a cancer vaccine that's using a vector that may come under the FDA vaccine guidelines, and then you've got the USP, the Pharmacopeia for advanced medicines, and the WHO for cell substrate characterization, and the, the old ICH5 QA viral safety um, guidelines. So it's really just an example here, and um, I'm happy to take questions later on on, on this. Um, and just to further this, you, know, you can see the comprehensive testing package that's needed at every mass master working in the production and, and then control cells. Next one, if you've got an adenovirus vector, it's just a classic example. You've got the master virus seed stock or working seed stock and then the bulk harvest and then as you purify down um, the different tests that you have to do, identity testing, sterility at the end and then the impurities as you go further down into the bulk, there's more residual impurity assays that are required, and the RCA, the replication competent assays on A549 cells looking for any replication competent virus, should it um, be a risk in the process. Uh, AV, so generally it can be come from plasmids, or you can have a bacular virus seed manufacturing system. Um, Generally, when it's a bacular virus, you've got the master seeds and the working seeds. Um, when it's a plasmid-based manufacturing system, it would go straight to the sort of bulk here, and you would characterise the plasmids, and then you would get the, the bulk harvest, and then the further downstream testing. Generally, AAVs don't tend to be um, require neutralising antiserum, but they may need to be some type of um, cytotoxicity. Um, optimization if they're cytotoxic to the detector cells on the in vitro assay. Um, again, just more of the uh, um, impurity testing. So it follows a very similar testing regime to to the um, the adenovirus. And then really this last slide is really just um, for plasmid DNA vectors that are maybe directed uh, directly injected into the patient. Because they're made in E. coli, they've got a different type of test schedule, and um, essentially because you know bacteria also can have viruses, they also, we also need to do the cell bank characterization of the bacteria, the identity of the plasmid um, by sequencing, and there's different methods employed. Really, it's like gram stain, the old methods for um, you know identifying. Uh, bacterial cells, gram negative, gram positive. Uh, then also the lab strain, it may have some genotype phenotype markers. Um, you want to know the plasmid in the cell. Is it in every cell in the cell bank or is it losing the plasmid? Is the copy number under control? Is the structure of the plasmid what it's expected to be? Is the sequence as, as it's expected to be? Is the clinical lot got the expected sequence um, of the plasmid? And then again, there'll be also host cell impurities that have to be removed and uh, shown to be removed. Um, and on that note, that's really the end of it. So really to thank you all again for um, your attendance. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Lovett. And now we will begin the question and answer segment of the webinar. But once again, I would like to remind the audience that you can still send your questions in via the questions tab located directly below your webinar screen. So now our first question is what downstream viral clearance approaches can be recommended for viral vector manufacture? Uh, Mark, would you like to answer this? 
Thank you, Steve. Yes, I can certainly uh, try to answer this question. In gene therapy in vector production, to see the manufacturing process upstream, downstream, purification, and et cetera, uh, and considering the type of viral vector, certain uh, modalities can be implemented in downstream processes. For example, in many cases, cell culture harvest is lysed using a chemical uh, lysis agent, uh, oftentimes the Triton uh, X100, in some cases a different uh, chemical. Uh, and some of these chemicals can actually support uh, you know, reduction of certain viruses, especially those that are so-called enveloped agents. So this is one area where downstream uh, or maybe even upstream clearance could be afforded using this chemical approach. Uh, purification aspect of viral vectors utilizing one, two, or in some cases three chromatography columns could in some cases support viral um, uh, removal. However, there is a limit, limited approach there, you know, especially in cases where immunity uh, chromatography is used as a single modality to purify the virus, which captures a uh, virus of interest, which is adenovirus or, you know, um, AAV vector, then that may not actually work for purification purposes. I'm sorry, that may not work for viral clearance purposes uh, specifically. So in many cases, these chromatography columns actually have uh, very limited, uh, you know, applications. In certain cases, actually, they may co-purify uh, adventitious agent along with the product, which may actually be disadvantageous in any case. Uh, therefore, what can be considered, you know, is perhaps, uh, you know, uh, pH treatment in some applications, as long as pH does not impact the, the product, uh, the vector itself. And in some cases, nanofiltration can be also considered. When I say nanofiltration, I, I mean nanofilters of, a, of larger pore size than 20 nanometers, or, or more specifically, nanofilters of a larger pore size than a vector of interest. So if a vector of interest is an adenovirus, which is about 24, 25 nanometers pore size, the 20 nanometers will not work. Therefore, larger filters uh, pore size will be used, uh, preferably 50 and above, to avoid any potential vector, vector loss. Uh, and in some cases, also uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, reduction of so-called retrovirus or some additional uh, larger viruses can be managed using these uh, nanofilters of larger pore size. So in a nutshell, that is probably kind of, uh, you know, uh, the answer to the question, and again, limited approach towards vector purification downstream and vector and viral removal downstream. Thank you. Our next question is, what is the typical timeline for viral vector safety testing of a master cell bank? Uh, Archie, would you like to answer this? Um, yeah, so gen generally speaking, if if we're following the current guidelines um, for this compendial tests, you'd be looking about 12 to 16 weeks. Generally, uh, the longest duration tests tend to be the in vivo, um, and if the mycobacteria culture assay is being requested by the um, the regulator, that's a 56D assay. But during when the master bank is, is made, generally there's maybe 200 vials of that made, and then one is taken from, and then a working bank made. Now, generally CMOs or CDMOs, they'll only make the 200 vials. So you can cut that timeline down by a few weeks, because what you can do is you can you can potentially manufacture during the time when the manufacturing of the master bank has been made under GMP, you can make the harvest of that for all of the different tests, like the identity, the in vivo, the in vitro, um, you know, the 9 CFR, etc. Because they all have different test item or volume requirements. Some require cell pellets, some require cell free um, conditioned media, such as the PER assay, some require lysates, like the um, in vitro. So you can actually manufacture with the cell bank the test samples, and in that way you don't need to culture the cells at the at the CRO um, in order to make the harvest. So you can cut that down in, in time by that method. But generally, 12 to 16 weeks would should do it. Thank you. Our next question is: What biosafety test method validation? is required for early phase and late phase clinical trials. 
Uh, Archie again would like to answer this. Um, yes. So for for early phase, so the way what we do is we all of our test methods are validated because for GMP compliance, the the guidelines state that they should be validated. So that's the term a generic validation of the of the method. When it's a compendial method, like the sterility assay or the mycoplasma, compendial culture and agar methods, um, broth and agar methods, generally you don't need to validate them, you just qualify them. So they would be qualified as long as you're running them to the pharmacopoeia method, same with the in vivo assay uh, or the 9 CFR. Um, so for GMP compliance, generally you should have a generic method validation. When you get into the more later phase of of the clinical trial, there is a thing they call it sort of like product specific validation where you may want to be testing three, maybe three to five harvests coming off of the manufacturing run with um, different operators and showing that your manufacturing process is consistent with the generic validated method and that it allows you to sort of narrow your specification and show reproducibility of the manufacturing process with the test method. And that's generally required for phase three and into commercial. That's Thank you. Our next question is, at what stage in process development safety by design should be implemented? Mark, would you like to answer this? Yes, thank you. Safety by design and quality by design, as I mentioned earlier, typically go hand in hand, and they should be considered in accordance with ICHQ8 uh, and some other uh, ICH guidance as early as possible in the process development. Uh, typically, that should be somewhere between the preclinical and phase one uh, point. Uh, typically, for the phase one clinical trial process development, should incorporate some elements of uh, safety and quality by design. Given the fact that this is a very early stage, it is not expected to have a full-blown QBD and SBD in it. Uh, you know, as we progress towards the phase two or phase three and commercial, more and more elements are built into the process so that uh, in a phase three clinical uh, settings, you have a process which, is, uh, which includes you know, most, if not all, of the safety by design and quality by design principles. So it's a progressive approach starting from the early stage clinical phase one onwards. Thank you. Our next question. Concerning adventitious agent detection, can NGS replace in vitro cell culture assay? Mark, again, would you like to answer this? Thank you. The, so the question is, can NGS replace in vitro cell culture assays? The answer is yes, it can. Uh, the question of how it can be done is probably another uh, you know, area to, uh, to discuss. In general, uh, you know, I think that uh, NGS has come to a point of maturity and understanding where implementation of NGS you know, is actually becoming a reality. Implementation is very, still very slow, but some companies are actually opting for it and adopting it in their systems. It can be applied in different areas in the manufacturing process for different samples. Uh, certainly, uh, cell banks come to, to you know, it's, it's an area where it can be considered. Uh, as well as uh, harvest testing as well, in many cases, from a as well. Now, the question of how it can be done is an important one because uh, you know, it can be done directly on the sample itself, which may lead to, uh, uh, to potential issues. Uh, and there is another way where you apply it as a readout method or readout point uh, towards at the end of the uh, in vitro uh, you know, stage of, of an assay be it a 9 CFR assay for serum or perhaps uh, you know, cell culture-based assay for harvest or cell culture-based assay for uh, cell banks. As a readout at the end, uh, using this technique actually can be a very powerful tool to avoid false negatives but also to maximize on detection of so-called live replicating virus if, if it exists there. Thank you. Uh, moving on, our next question is, what methods are available to measure the host cell DNA size? in a viral vector final product? Uh, Archie, would you like to answer this? Um, yeah, so <clears throat> the methods that we've employed are um, using real-time PCR with a different amplicon size. So, for example, you would have a 100 base pair amplicon, you would have a 200 base pair 
amplicon and maybe a 300 base pair amplicon and in that way you can test <coughs> the sample for the residual DNA um, host cell DNA using these three different sized PCRs and you can you can then provide a qualitative readout of whether there is um, fragments of 100 base pairs or above or 200 base pairs or 300 base pairs above in the product um, and, and generally there's been you know there's a lot of discussion on this in the regulator um, and generally they're looking for shearing of the DNA host cell DNA below 300 200 base pairs um, so this is a way that it can be done um, and it could be used to uh, for the, the process uh, development, the manufacturing process development, and then it could be implemented. Thank you. Well, thank you for your answers, and thank you, audience members, for your questions. Unfortunately, I think that's all the time we have for them. Uh, before I finish the webinar, though, I would like to take this opportunity to ask our presenters, Mark and Artie, if they have any closing remarks. So, Mark, do you have any closing remarks? Uh, well, this is Mark. Uh, from my perspective, I don't have any specific closing remarks beyond what I have stated in my presentation. I'd like to thank the audience for attendance. I'd like to thank, thank the uh, organizers for setting up this uh, webinar. It was a pleasure to, uh, to be of help. And before we finish, Artie, do you have any closing remarks for our audience? Um, not specifically as well. I would just like to thank everyone again um, also. Thanks very much. Well, thank you both. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our presenters. Once again, that was Mark Pladzik, Chief Technology Officer at Lysogene, and Archie Lovett, Life Sciences Biosafety Scientific Director at SGS. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. I would also like to remind our audience that you can view this and other webinars on demand by visiting biopharma-asia.com forward slash on demand hyphen webinars. And if you are watching this on demand, then please feel free to send your questions over to me at stephen dot edwards at biopharma asia dot com and we'll get those answers back to you. Thank you everyone. Have a great day. <laughs>